Parasites. Is there anything more punk bred than these creatures whose entire existence is based on living in their parents' basements? And by parents' basements, of course, I mean your aorta. Virtually, they're basically the same thing if you think about it. In the events of Deranged, South Korea is under attack, much like my video will be by them as soon as it's released. A mystery illness springs up seemingly from nowhere, causing people to run into the waters and drown themselves against their will. But the question would remain throughout. How is this being caused? Is there any real world way that this could happen? Because actually it might be possible, which is pretty horrific. And Given some of these stringent parameters, of course, that it's kind of going to need to, you know, involve, probably nothing to worry about. But in today's episode, let's discuss the parasitology, the symptoms, why it's happening, and how it's affecting the brain. But before getting into it, if you like these movies, then join my Discord. We actually have movie night once a month where we all watch something together, and then I generally cover it. It's pretty fun. Also, the gaming channel, Roanoke Games, is nearing 20,000 subscribers, and stuff that I actually play over there ends up on this channel, so come hang out. Links for both in the description. But apart from that, Thank you for your continued support of the channel. You guys are the reason this even exists. But first, this episode is sponsored by Factor. Head to factor75.com and use code Roanoke50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. Summer, while still incredibly hot, will be drawing to a close here shortly. And look, I think we all know we got about three months of holidays ahead of us, and we will probably not be eating the best. If you want to maintain your energy levels, fuel your body with good food, and in general hit your health goals or maintain them, then look no further. With calorie smart options, keto, protein plus, vegan, and veggie, and within those choices, 35 options with more than 60 add-ons a week, you can eat good tasting, never frozen food that is also good for you. We all fall into the trap of ordering out or over shopping at the grocery store, then throwing out bad food, wasting money. But with Factor, then it's two minute heating time, you have a delicious meal, no more than two minutes away, and you can actually plan your meals out. So if you want seven meals because you know you're gonna have seven dinners, then just order seven meals from Factor. So if you're ready to start eating healthy to offset all the candy that will be consumed in October, then by heading to factor75.com and using code Roanoke50, you get 50% off your first factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. All right, let's get back to it. We kick off our story with this being a Korean movie, so once again, copyright from Korea Telecom is going to be amazing. You hate to see it. Our story begins in the waters of Humansville, Missouri. Probably. Like, seriously, why is that even a place? As we next jump over to a man on a roller coaster in a business suit carrying everything. Exhausted by the day, there is no chance of rain as a drought has hit the country, so he's gonna be staying out there all day. Returning home, a man is just knocking back some water like an absolute water fiend as his family goes upstairs. The man's name is Mr. Kim, and this is Mr. Kim's assistant, and he's basically directed to go home as he sits down on the couch. Heading home for the evening, he's upset he's spaghetti about what kind of amounts to being like a servant for this guy. Yeah, I can't blame him on that one. I buck authority as well. It's actually one of my worser qualities. Heading towards his apartment, his brother is waiting for him outside. He asks about the company that he's working for and if he likes it. His brother gave him some bad advice on what to invest in, and then Jay lost all of his money over it, and now he's angry. Which, I mean, the choice was always yours, my man. Nobody held your feet to the fire and made you invest. Sometimes you just gotta take your personal L on that one, big dog. I too invested heavily in Enron and sold all stocks of Google. It was virtually worthless. Heading inside, his son asks if they can go to a theme party for his birthday as they are excited to see him, but he's like a wet blanket at a party and just kind of straight up ruins the vibe. Like, thanks dad. Evidently, celebrating birthdays is a luxury that they can't afford. Like, look man, I'm not a dad, but you gotta like stow that crap at the door. So you'll actually learn to not really like this dude, but I guess kind of feel bad for him, at least marginally, maybe slightly. All right, look, you're not gonna feel bad for him at all, but you know, give it your best shot. I don't make the rules, I just kinda work here. So his wife comes in saying that she can go get a job if they're hurting that bad for money, which he's like, oh, are you trying to embarrass me? Like, bro, you clearly need a hand. Just form Team Ramrod already and both go work for a while. Of course, then again, Youngling's care is probably just as expensive over there as it is over here, so it really just evens back out. So he goes to bed upset as his brother continues looking into a company called Joa Pharmaceutical. His brother literally assaults a dude over him giving him bad intel on who to invest in, and again, that was y'all's decision. It, like, it's funny. What we will see in this movie is people taking responsibility for situations that they had absolutely no control over, but when it comes to decisions that they do have control over, they like to blame other people. It's honestly a bizarre take. So the next morning, Jay's co-worker starts talking mad smack to him about getting burned in the shares market, and how the company they are working for was acquired by another company called Bronstar. You know, real interesting corporate takeover talk. In fact, I'd go as far as to say this movie likely could have been 80 minutes 
if not for all the extraneous stuff that's like happening all over. It's not at Shin Godzilla levels with like the meetings, which yes, I know that is the point of the movie, but other stuff, like you'll see what I mean here shortly. So Jay says that he hit rock bottom and there's really nowhere to go but up. Are you kidding me? You can always grab a shovel and dig deeper, baby. Meanwhile, Jay Pill yells at his girlfriend telling her, well, why don't you just pull out a loan so we can pay back my brother? She's pretty apprehensive about it. As well as she should be, Jay Pill hasn't been exactly the most amazing investor with an like a stellar track record with money making schemes like at all so after work jay which is the older brother then goes and drinks with her because she's concerned jay pill is going to do something reckless like get a loan shark jay goes on to say that his brother is poison and he messes up everything and i mean if you're hurting for money why do you got money to drink with it's kind of an interesting concept there brother heading back home he finds his wife and younglings eating in the offspring's room just absolutely ravenously as apparently they're quite hungry the next morning evidence begins to present itself about the horrors that are to come a couple are arguing arguing about working out, which is very standard. As the guy goes to pee in the river, which is pretty gross, he sees something. Poking it with a tennis racket, he then falls in and realizes, oh my god, it's a guy. Calling the cops, Jay Pill then arrives to check out the guy in the water, and as they turn him over, he appears rather desiccated. This isn't supposed to happen overnight, as Jay Pill asks if we are ruling out alien abductions. The doctor says two more came in this morning like this with the same issues, so it's a little strange. Yes, just a little strange. Later that night, there are dozens of people who begin showing up in the river face down as the next morning, Jay's his wife wakes him up telling him to come watch the news as he refuses to watch it in horror. Over at the station, Jay Pill is told about how some sort of issue is beginning to spread and yes, again, both brothers having their beginning names Jay is confusing. Just know, main character is just Jay. His brother, who's the cop, is Jay Pill. Now we know. They get tasked with trying to find the contaminators in the area. So Jay Pill is then put on the case and I'm also aware I'm very likely not pronouncing this correctly because when I watched the movie, it sounded nothing like how I'm saying it. But but I cannot replicate it. So uh, you just get Southern Roanoke's attempt at speaking Korean and brother, it ain't good. Over at a golf course, things are about to get way worse for everyone. As they walk over to the carts, Jay tries to talk about the news but gets shut down by some random dude in a tunnel snakes jacket as Mr. Kim up front is saying how thirsty he is. He's been parched for days. Drinking some water, they continue their way as then they pull up to a body of water. Kim is crushing the water as he looks out at the lake and makes him make a run for it. Entering the water, he then starts going absolutely ham as he yells help, but by the time they get to him, he is also desiccated and has drowned, which is an odd combination. Jay Pill is now up the water reservoir as a man then yells for some reason about where the water comes from. I have no idea why this guy's yelling. Hey, like, literally, why are you doing this? So he continues on saying what everyone was doing that summer. Jay Pill asks about the family that committed the sewer slide here, but his questioning is dismissed, which he's a cop, so why is it dismissed? I don't know. So as the other Jay comes home, he sees his family absolutely consuming the water as he yells at them to stop, but gets totally smacked down by his wife as her sister has met her in, and she's not really in the whole, yeah, you're a douche, but I'm trying to be a supportive wife role. I mean, honestly, Jay has needed a boot up the backside the whole time for being just an absolute edgelord, so finally, thank God somebody yelled at him. So that night, as Jay Pill sleeps in his car because nobody will let him stay over due to his poor financial advice, it's actually just preceding him at this point, he calls up his girlfriend, he just kind of launches into a monologue about complaining about it, as she's uh, not pulling the loan for him either, so he gets upset about that, so he decides to cry himself to sleep, blaming everyone else as people begin running past the car. As he wakes up the next morning, he gets out and then looks out, seeing there's quite a few bodies in the water. Calling in the actual police force, evidently that night quite a few people had jumped into the waters all over the area. Oh hey, Busan was one of them. Hopefully nobody took a train there just to get totally got. So as we jump over to- oh god, a meeting. They are discussing what they should do as they have no idea what is actually happening to cause this, but they can see that whatever it is, is spreading. As they discuss the symptoms, it first appears that hunger increases, followed by a massive decrease in appetite, accompanied with excessive thirst, and ultimately two to three days later, you are bodied. There were no diseases that matched the profile specifically, however, there is a part of the brain that appears to be targeted. Uh, and this is a somewhat medical channel, so let's get into it. The brain is a highly sensitive organ, but the most important organ according to the brain. Is this lump of fat and cells in our head egotistical? The answer is yes, which also brings into question why the brain knows that, and yet it still continues to be the way that it is. The horrors are never ending, yet still I remain silly. Concerning your body's status on basically nutrition and thirst, these are typically regulated by the hypothalamus through other hormone activation. For appetite increase, when the stomach is completely empty and blood sugar begins to fall, the lining of the stomach will produce a hormone called ghrelin. This will make its way to the receptors of the hypothalamus, which activates the neurons indicating to the brain that hunger is increasing and it's time to eat. It's going to have a plethora of consequences, such as inducing mood swings, typically towards the negative mood, which actually is beneficial as it makes you more aggressive so that you seek out your next meal more fervently. Now, this type of increase can be for a multitude of reasons, 
but when appetite increases dramatically, as it does in the movie, typically something like a tapeworm would be suspected. The reason is tapeworms will set up shop in your intestines, and as you eat, they eat. And this means less food for the host as the tapeworm continues to grow, resulting in less nutritional uptake for your intestines. This in turn causes the body to have low blood sugar, which causes the stomach to produce more ghrelin in kind, triggering the hypothalamus to respond, increasing hunger. Thirst operates in a very similar manner. Water homeostasis is maintained through osmoreceptors in the brain. As hydration runs low, blood thickens and osmotic pressures change. It then will trigger these receptors in the brain, a lot residing on the hypothalamus. However, there are many more on the circumventricular organs, being the vascular organ of lamina terminalis and the subfornical organ, to tell the rest of the brain that it's really time to drink. This can present itself as lethargy, actually, as the body tries to maintain the water it has by making you move less. The kidneys are also affected, which decreases output as the body tries to maintain as much water as possible. The human body is fascinating concerning its ability to react and adapt to the environment to keep alive. These osmoreceptors can actually be altered in several ways, however, depending on what is near them, which is crucial to understanding how this infection progresses amongst those afflicted with it. But back to the movie. So team lead yells at a guy saying that they don't have a week to get results, but the tests have a physical time needed to be completed. You literally cannot rush those. It's like trying to make time go physically faster. It's impossible, you huge nerd. So Jay Pill now gets a call back from toxicology and says that there's nothing in the water, just plankton and larva like normal. You might want to focus on that larva aspect though. Also, brain-eating amoebas are in there, but that's a different episode. The reason is uh, that brain-eating amoebas are in there is they're everywhere actually. Kind of makes you wonder why there's not more cases of it, as pretty much every body of water on the planet has it, as well as like in the soils. I know Kurzgesagt did an episode on this where they indicated that antibodies do nothing against it. I believe that's unequivocally false. There must be some sort of immune measure to prevent the infection from destroying your brain, just given the sheer exposure, like the entire human race has. And like every summer when people jump in the lake, you're probably exposed to it. But all right, that doesn't really matter. Uh, we're getting way off topic, but I'd rank brain-eating amoebas right up there with prions as far as the absolute horror that they inflict. Anyhow, Jay Pill cannot figure out why they are jumping in the water, so he uses his God-given right to poke it with a stick while people are all over drowning themselves. Remember, always use the stick first, never your fingers. And secondly, try finger but hole. As the montage progresses in the worst way, one person actually in a bathtub had worms coming out of their body. The doctor says that they are horsehair worms, which is correct, but they shouldn't be in humans, so why are they? He suggests they are a mutant form of horsehair that had jumped to humans somehow, which is very interesting. So what are horsehair? horsehair worms. Horsehairs typically choose insects to infect. They will typically enter an insect during a larva stage and then their favorite target is going to be a grasshopper. As they increase the appetite of the host, they will continue to grow and as they reach adulthood, this is where the real problems begin. They will direct insects via their nervous system to go towards the water. This process is not well understood, however, there may be a reason it happens, which we will discuss here in a few minutes, which is absolutely horrifying as if it turns out to be true, which it appears it does. So rev up those gene encoders. But what we do know for absolute sure is that the worms control the insect's nervous system, resulting in them entering the water and then the insect drowning itself. Upon doing so, they will then exit out of the body as an adult. The doctor suggests that the larva may have entered either the mouth or back door when the families were swimming at the water reservoir upstream. They had been feeding on them for months and then they grew into what they are now. The water where the bodies are found are now likely inundated with this larva. So this horrific news drops as everyone starts freaking out, calling loved ones as Jay runs home. Returning home, Jay then finds his family absolutely lost in the sauce drinking the water. Heading to the hospital, it's quite crowded. As they begin scanning the infected, they find that they are in fact containing these parasites. The horsehair worms have set up shop in the small intestine, and once again, this would cause hunger as the larva grew to massive sizes, feeding on the nutrition being supplied by the small intestine as food was being broken down. Jay gets his family ready to rock as a group of doctors discuss the parasite absolutely colonizing everyone's body. They attach to the walls, and if they try to remove them by force, this could cause massive hemorrhaging. So they go with the anti-parasite medication, much to the dismay of Yoon Jo. But before they can run a test, however, one woman's daughter already took the medication, which then led her to flatline out, as we see others attempted to do the same, leading to their ends as well. But why? Why? This is one that's a bit odd. The medication that exists should not be damaging the person, but should be lethal to the actual parasite. As a result, what I imagine is happening is the poison entered the system, the parasite would ingest it, which would make it relatively sick. But it does not appear to be enough to do its job of removing it. Instead, the parasite would attempt to escape the hostile environment, leading to an incredible amount of intestinal damage, piercing the small intestines in several areas, leading to shock and ultimately the flatline person. So to take this parasite out, 
out, you would need a specifically tailored antiparasitic medication to disrupt its metabolism, and enough of it to prevent it from doing what it just did so that it can passively let go of the walls of your intestine and then move through naturally. And by naturally, I think we all know what I'm saying, and that's going to be a horrific experience. So, for some reason, Jay is still getting his family ready to go to the hospital like several hours later. His wife continues cooking food, what a chad, as his offspring complain about their throats burning up. His wife then looks over and sees the water in the sink and continues to get lost in the sauce. At the hospital, the man from the reservoir confesses something to Jay Pill that is really not his fault. I'm not sure why he's taking responsibility for it, but he says he turned a blind eye to it, which it's not even really turning a blind eye. Well, I'll tell you later. So Jay Pill then gets a call saying his niece and nephew are infected and everyone starts going ham for the H2O. Everyone begins trying to leave the hospital to get to a body of water as Jay's family is overcome by the same instinctual drive. Grabbing his whole family in a chokehold as all he can really do is hold them down as in other areas people begin drowning themselves. Oh god, one woman drowns in a fish water tank. Ugh, it's gotta taste terrible. Mmm. Mm, God. So, you may also be asking at this point, if everyone is just trying to drown themselves, why not just drink water? Well, see, the issue appears to be that the hypothalamus is naturally stimulated more to be thirsty. The parasite upon reaching adulthood is influencing the hypothalamus to tell the person that they are thirsty and that they need to go near water. However, being human, we have access to smaller pools of water that we cannot drown ourselves in, such as just a bottled water or a jug of it, which is why everyone is thirsty. The thirst, however, would continue to grow and no matter how much of the water they drink, they feel that they are dehydrated. Animals would also have the same drive, but instead of bottles of water, they would just naturally head towards a water source to drink, resulting in the adult parasite coming out of the body. But this confuses the parasite to a degree as humans are able to internally ingest water, but not be surrounded by water, preventing the adult horsehair from exiting out of the body. Eventually, though, the push to drink water becomes too great, and people will fall back on instinct and run towards a body of water where the life cycle of the horsehair completes itself. Also, I just want to point out a lot of people would probably body themselves by disrupting their electrolyte concentrations due to ingesting that much water. Literally, they're reaching levels of water toxicity. So Yoon Jo then walks the lobby. Apparently after the initial rush, everyone sort of just kind of chills out and passes out from the exertion. However, a lot of people were lost in that initial run to the water. The national health emergency is then declared as the drowned have passed 3,000. They suspect about a million people are infected, and to protect those that are infected, they put them in areas where they cannot easily escape from. The man from earlier, who's taking responsibility for things that he saw, says, some men dropped some dogs off in the water one night. He just thought they were big douchers, so he took them and then buried them up the mountain and didn't report it as tourist season was a few days away. Again, how did you know what was like going on? Like what they were even doing? In this movie for some reason, again, everyone takes responsibility for things they had no control over and it's like, why? Like Jay gets mad at his wife, right, for taking the offspring to the water earlier that led to their infection? Like seriously, bro, how was she supposed to know there were mutant horse hairs in there? This is not like a normal human rationalization. So Jay Pill now gets a call as in the crisis center the boss man is yelling at everyone about getting a cure for this. One guy runs in yelling chief as Jay then talks to his family about not biting the dust over this. His son asks if they will. Well, you might. I mean, stranger things have happened like this entire movie premise. But back at the hospital the guy then eats saying that he was cured of the parasite using this medication and it's like Windazole or whatever. This anti-parasitic medication appears to work without flatlining the host. The news then goes out as everyone starts trying to go ham finding this stuff but no stores are currently carrying it. Jay then tries to find some to no avail as he returns to work and talks to his friend and he's informed that they are out of stock. It was discontinued months ago due to poor sales and as they talk to the main guy he says they will start production again but it will take some time as there is a maximum output capacity. The plan is to start production that night. So Jay continues his walk around the city getting back to the hospital as the infected are sealed in that night to prevent their escape. This upsets the non-infected as Jay then runs upstairs and bangs on the window and somehow his wife sees him. What are the odds of that. He then mouths in the window, they took her baby. And if you got that reference, was that documentary not just absolutely cracked out? Anyways, so it appears as though the push to head to water starts at night, which there's actually a reason for this. To understand this, you have to understand the body's natural cycles and the endocrine system. And this is going to be a relatively simplified version, but it'll get the job done. Specifically relating to one hormone in particular, this helps us understand why this is maybe happening at night and relates to the body's own natural defenses against parasites and eosinophil activity. First and foremost, the immune system is not that great at combating parasites. We have countermeasures, but typically our bodies will just learn to
to live with it. In some ways, our bodies have become reliant on parasites to mediate our own internal actions. As horrible as it is, parasites can actually have a calming effect on the immune system, which is why in first world countries, allergies are on the rise or could potentially be due to this because our immune systems are overactive. And this is because we have no parasites and if you get infected, it's then cleared with medication. In fact, if we don't blow ourselves up and we end up colonizing Mars, we will need to bring parasites with us or at least something that mimics them to maintain generations afterwards to prevent them from just basically being allergic to everything. Anyhow, eosinophils whole job is to attack parasites and attempt to lyse them through cytotoxic attacks. Typically, it's not very effective, but a for effort immune system. The endocrine system, however, can get in the way of this. Cortisol is a steroid hormone, typically reaching its highest levels in the morning. It will then trail off by night, allowing you to sleep. Now, what is a steroid hormone? Essentially, steroids, as the name implies, kind of get in the way of the immune system functioning. Typically, they're known to be immunosuppressive. They will impair T lymphocyte activation and basically prevent macrophages from doing what they need to do. It's not exactly ideal for anybody, but have you ever heard of the man flu, right? And it's like, it's a running joke that men uh, kind of like ham up the fact that we're sick more so than women do. It's this whole thing. There's actually a biological reason for this and it's probably gonna piss some people off. So uh, the female immune response is actually more, not more impaired, but the symptoms of it are usually not as strong due to estrogen being their main sex hormone, I guess the best way you could put it. So when they get sick, it doesn't feel as bad, but when men get sick, it feels a lot worse. So that's one of the things that kind of describe why men will be like, oh, get the priest when we get sick, whereas women are like, oh, I'm, I'm totally fine. I mean, I feel like crap, but I'm fine. No, there's a reason for it, believe it or not. Anyhow, we're going to continue on. Where was I? Okay, yes, cortisol is a steroid hormone, as mentioned, and typically it's reaching its highest levels in the morning and then will trail off at night, allowing you to sleep. And this can cause your immune system to not be as effective during the day, but at night, as levels decrease of this cortisol, the immune system activity will increase. So what I believe is happening is as night falls, the cortisol levels will actually decrease as is normal and the immune system activity pushes the adult horse hairs to become more agitated, resulting in them, in turn, increasing the levels of thirst to epic portions. This causes the person to reach a level of almost insanity trying to get to water in an unshakable drive to submerge themselves through a feeling that they can't describe. As a result, this leads to the drownings to mostly happen at night as activity markedly increases. But during the day, the same can be done if the person is close enough to water. It just becomes more of a feverish attempt at night. So everyone in the gym is going absolutely crazy trying to escape as they deal with the same issue as the night finally passes and even more people got bodied that night who were not quarantined. This also appears to be a social aspect as when one person freaks out, so do the rest. So that night, Joe Pharmaceutical apparently failed to produce any medication as a hearing is held as the head guy states the machinery was overloaded and failed. Oh really? Interesting. So he's reamed about mismanaging funds as one guy brings up a great point saying, just release the formula so other companies can make it. Here is where it gets a bit sticky. The formula is owned by them. The government cannot just take it from a private business. Now, therein lies the issue. Is it better to release the formula by force to publicize it for the good of the people at the cost of the intellectual property, which then sets a dangerous precedence, or do you protect the rights of IP, which then can lead to people being bodied? Obviously, there is a lot of shades of gray with this conundrum, but personally, less government meddling, the better, and the rights need to be preserved. But that said, national emergency of this proportion may be time to get that formula by force, or at least find a comparable medication that behaves similarly. In fact, a lot of times, generic versions will be made. But it's just one of those things that it's sort of like the right answer now, the wrong answer later, or option two is the wrong answer now, but the right answer later. So this dork says that he won't disclose the formula as Jay then drives the heathenistic 100 kilometers per hour, or in the Lord's superior units, it's about 60 miles per hour. They offer a very generous government benefit to the company if they will just release the formula. Okay, Plankton. So at the company though itself, people are attacking the gate, ready to start beating some nerds' tails for withholding the medication. As Jay and his co-worker entered, they get one of the Windazole as Jay then goes to leave with it. Running past a mother and her offspring, he decides to stop and help her, and it goes over about as well as a wet fart in church as they realize he's got medication, and in the ensuing scuffle, all the medication is stomped and lost. Nice going, guys. You'll see this actually happens several times. It's so frustrating, but it's almost comical how he keeps finding medication and then just gets taken away a second later. Back at the meeting, the government is informed the staff has rejected their offer. At this point, I say we show them our peaceful ways by force. Jay gets a call from his son about how the families are getting thrown out of the hospital since the medication isn't being made to counter the issue. So getting another call, it's his wife asking if they are giving up on them. Evidently, Jay 
Ray hasn't eaten in like days, so his wife is concerned. As he yells at her, he broke keep it together. Also, like I'm just saying his wife leans over and then tells another woman to stop being weak. Like she's just basically taking what she needs to say to him and then just be like, oh, it's you. Anyways, Alpha Chad's status. So Jay then blames himself once again after he just yelled at his wife. And again, everybody's taking responsibility for weird stuff. His co-worker starts trying to figure out how all the Windazole or Windazole went missing so quickly, suggesting that it must be hoarded some. And just as this mutant horse hair showed up, what are the odds of that? Meanwhile, Jay Pill is doing his own investigation into the company as it's connected to Joe Pharmaceutical. So back at the meeting, the huge corporate dork says, why doesn't the government just simply buy 51% of the company and then they can release the formula to them as they will now have controlling shares. Or you could just, oh, I don't know, buy the rights to the drug instead of buying the whole company. But this dork says the investors want profit. Ooh, that's greasy. So the prime minister says he has to consider all his options. Non-cop J then begins looking into Joa to see what they've been doing with the medication. The crisis team figures out that it takes about three to four months for the horse hairs to fully grow into adults. And this is the increased appetite stage. They then increase the thirst about two to three days and then after that, the person drops. So the idea becomes as long as they can keep everyone away from the water, then they can keep them alive for longer, but eventually the parasite will force its way out regardless of water nearby. Around that time, one woman is seen in the bathroom with the worms coming out of her, and this puts more pressure on the prime minister as he tells the dork to name his price. That night, everyone is going absolutely ham as Jay's wife sees the water. Jay approaches the building, seeing a man come out of it with Wenzole as he approaches the apartment door. A man on the other side of the door says he has one box left. Jay Jay gives him the money as Jay's wife goes goblin mode on the water. The police then show up as the seller flushes his last box. See, comically close. Jay's wife gets prevented from drowning by the other woman as she's told to get her act together by the woman she told to get her act together earlier. So the seller is loaded up in a paddy wagon as for some reason they just leave Jay chilling in his bathroom. So Jay Pill then calls Jay and says he knows where they are hiding the windazole. Jay Pill beat the living hell out of one of the researchers threatening his life as he spills the spaghetti out of his pocket about the whole thing. The project actually started out as a pretty good one. Use the horse hairs to prevent things like Alzheimer's and dementia, but they were bought out and their department was shut down. So rather than just let the research go to waste, they agreed to make money off it. Nice. <laughs> So they use the mutant horse hairs in the water supply and would develop a cure. The windazole that they would then use to cure it basically had to, they had to make it reach like a fever pitch. They projected maybe like five people getting bodied from this, which uh, nice going nerd. So you're probably wondering though, how exactly they intended to use a parasite to prevent diseases like this because those are genetic diseases. Well, strap in because uh, new evidence while horrific is highly interesting as it turns out it may be true. To understand horse hair abilities, we need to know what those even are in the first place. The insect's nervous system is fairly simplistic, but fundamentally there is very little difference functionality from like grasshoppers and ours. The complexity of it is just amplified in humans. By horsehair being able to override the nervous system and interact with it, it must possess the ability to create similar signaling hormones that can connect to the receptors. So how is this accomplished? Recently, it was discovered that horsehair worms had a crazy amount of similar genes to a praying mantis and not just like, oh, well, these two genes appear to be linked. No, I'm talking like 5% of its genome appeared to be a mantis genome. This divergence at first was maybe just thought like there was tissue contamination from the actual mantis. However, three days later, the worms were still producing mRNA sequences related to the mantis genome. This is known as horizontal gene transfer. You can think of this almost like genetic contamination by another species. Two species exist and typically a mediator such as a virus can transfer genes by accident. If you are sick and then your friend catches it from you, there is a small chance that some of your genome gets actually incorporated into their genome through this virus. But the worms appear to adopt large large portions of the mantis genome for one specific reason, to be able to interface with the nervous system more effectively. And if this turns out to be true, I don't need to tell you how absolutely insane it would be because you actually could potentially, if you could reverse engineer that, you could transfer entire segments of genes to another species, which I mean, we have CRISPR, but basically it becomes a mix and match thing that we can do rather than just little tiny gene loci. Like imagine if you will, there is a, obviously there are issues issues with amyloid plaques that build up due to Alzheimer's, you could actually take a healthy section of genetic coding and horizontally gene transfer it to somebody who has the unhealthy section and it would get rid of Alzheimer's. It's things like that that's like, oh my god, <laughs> like, this is crazy. Now again, obviously, this is the horse hair worm receiving genetic information from the host, not the horse hair worm implanting genetic information, but obviously there is a mechanism there that allows for it to happen. So if we can copy that, we might be able
able to fix a lot of issues with our own genetics. But again, it has to be confirmed that that's specifically what's happened. But the worms appear to adopt large portions of the mantis genome for one specific reason, to be able to interface with the nervous system more effectively. It has typically been a complete mystery as to how the horsehairs could inspire such a complex maneuver of leading a species to water and then causing it to drown itself so that it can exit out of the body. But the horizontal gene transfer turns out, or if it does turn out to be the actual mechanism at play here, then again, that means that it could be applied elsewhere, which also means, I've, I've maintained this since the beginning, microbiology is the superior science. Marine biologists get dunked on. But this will help to explain the jump to humans. So Jay Pill then heads to the storage area, standing there like a main character, as Jay arrives, threatening the researcher. And I mean, it was completely on site. How did he even know he was involved? Searching the room, they then find boxes containing the actual drug that they need, as they are then locked in, and then someone throws a Molotov, burning the medication. Again, comically close. The researcher then looks on as a man approaches with the drip. Attempting to escape, both of the brothers are trapped in there as it begins burning down. Running low on oxygen, they both start to pass out, realizing, yeah, we're probably totally screwed, as J. Pill then apologizes to his brother, as then they start to burn out their lungs. But luckily, J. Pill's girlfriend shows up, crashing through the door, and it's a good thing she crashed through that side, as otherwise, that would have been a major miscalculation if she kept driving and then just ran over them. So she gets the door open as Jay wakes up. He runs back into the building trying to find any remaining medication, but it's completely burnt up. Comical. Jay's wife calls, saying that they are also taking the phones, which is a little dumb as, I don't know, that seems a little unnecessary. And she tells him not to blame himself. And I mean, why not? Everyone else is blaming themselves for everything else in the movie. So the phone is taken and that's that. He has a nice cry over it in a structurally unsound building as Jay Pill's girlfriend gets a call saying Twitter is blowing up. Back at the gym, the worms are starting to exit out of people regardless regardless of water. The government has agreed to take over Joa Pharma and they will start producing medication in a week, which is too long and everybody will have been got. Jay then asks where the crude medication is. Joa is trying to sell the company to the government for around 5 billion when they're actually only worth around 700 million. Ah, complete scumbags. But the prime minister's hands are completely tied. So Jay has his brother drive him as he's gonna go make off some knockoff Windazel and all the researchers that were associated with the project have already fled the country long ago as it was determined the guy who mastermind this is is the dork who wants $5 billion. His accomplice was the guy who pretended to be cured in the first place. What a bunch of tools. So Jay then forces Jay Pill out of the car in the middle of nowhere, as then he kind of just heads out to his work. I'm not sure why he did that. Meanwhile, at work, he rallies everyone protesting out in front to clear a path as then he drives up to the research and development area. As the cops give chase, they're then called off and told not to pursue and to let him through in case he can actually pull it off. As the deal starts going through, the prime minister is told something before he then signs the deal, which causes him to call the dork an absolute waste of human life. Truly, he would be. Clap them cheeks on the spot. Heading inside the facility, the interns run out, showing him the location of the crude materials, ultimately helping him carry it out so that they can start creating the anti-parasite medication that works as Jay's wife starts going absolutely feral on the sprinkler system. Seeing another woman in the area, it's of great concern, and then turning into a fight, she attempts to prevent all of them from turning on the sprinkler, because this would cause basically all the adults to exit out of their body. So you have to ask yourself, where is security to prevent any of this? Jay Pill sees everyone going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs as the sprinklers are trying to be activated, so he runs upstairs and shuts off the water to prevent them from turning back on. So back at Big Pharma, Jay has stolen the crude, and that night everyone will be going into production concerning the medication. As Jay gets back to the gym, his family is still alive, as everyone is mega jazzed over this. The medications go out to take out the horse hairs as everyone is fiending for that medication. Of course, uh, all that still has to come out of you, so that is not going to be a very pleasant experience. Meanwhile, the huge corporate dork gets egged and will have a blast grabbing ankles in prison. All's well that ends well. As the pandemic subsides, Jay Pill talks about the parasites with his girlfriend as Jay Original takes his wife and the younglings to the amusement park. He talks about how they should take a trip abroad and she mentions the horse hairs maybe being abroad as one guy managed to float all the way out into the ocean and likely has infested the waters. Of course, now this outbreak would be on the world's radar, so any infection would immediately be squashed with the same anti-parasite medication. But thus concludes Deranged. So you're probably wondering how the parasite jumped to humans. It's all very simple, Diane. Allegedly. Actually, it's not. Utilizing the dogs, a parasite was inspired to jump from insect to mammal. It was thought that this would just cause intestinal discomfort in people, and they would go to the hospital, realize they were infected by the parasites, and that it was resistant to regular forms of medication. A canine's nerve 
nervous system, after all, is really not going to be the same as the humans, but the reality is they are similarly complex. After adopting canine genes, what was likely not known at the time by the staff are, as always, the unknown consequences associated with alteration to a species. You never quite know how changing just a small thing up front will have cascading issues downstream, like a butterfly effect almost. You actually see this a lot with diseases. You can cure it, it mutates, and becomes worse. It's the arms race of life. So as a larva enters humans, the unknown ability of horizontal gene transfer that exists in real life and appears to be how horsehair worms actually operate the host's nervous system would cause the horsehair worm to take on human genomes to influence our meat suits as well. And this would put pressure on the hypothalamus resulting in hunger and then extreme thirst through hormonal manipulation. Eventually, the manipulation of our nervous system would go beyond just a feeling of, oh, I'm a little discomfort and thirsty to actually enter the realm of involuntary musculature contractions as seen when Kim cannot control himself and then screams for help. As the parasites leave the body, it appears all at once though that they do suck out the remaining fluid from the host resulting in the desiccated appearance. Essentially, you are de-blooded through your small intestine. And that is how I believe the horsehair worms were completely an out of control project, meant to just affect those who were immunocompromised or possibly even the elderly, and even then not lead to a massive loss of life. It instead would absolutely alter the behavior and functionality of the nervous system due to its ability to take on the genome of the host. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. Personally, I don't care if it was created in the lab. The parasite is absolutely getting body by anti-parasite medication. It doesn't make much sense why it's just like, oh, not this one, but the other one. So what do you guys think? Let me know down in the comments. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Games, as well as Roanoke Tales channel link down in the description. But speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, I'd like to thank our astrophysicist, Death's Dancer, and Feather. Thank you guys very much. Next, I'd like to thank our scientists, Dakota23, Lucian Dragon, Metric System, Scott Boo, and Trash Panda in a trench coat. Thank you guys as well. And the rest of my patrons, you are greatly appreciated. All this is because of you. Thank you. It's I basically to the, it's all for you, Damien. Anyways, that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and we'll see y'all in the next one.